All right, guys, welcome to volume 16 of Nightcrawlers. Today we have a really awesome non vanilla guest. <laughs> Rieko, thank you for coming to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. My pleasure. How are you today? Yeah, feeling amazing. What about you? I'm doing great. I'm ready. <laughs> That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> awesome. So, Rieko, if you could please tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, how you started like learning about psychology and business. Just, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, sure. So, my, I guess I was like this weird child. Everybody, I feel like everybody says that. So it sounds like a cliche, but um, I was in primary school when I first went to the bookstore and asked my mom to buy me a book about PTSD. No joke. <laughs> no joke. And um, I think I was always sort of interested in in people's mind and how people operate and, um, you know, the, the things that trauma can do to all of us. And um, I never stopped learning from that point on. Um, but when I decided to get a certificate was when I was working pretty closely with um, ex-detainees, so essentially refugees who had been detained in Australia for years and years, and they had just come out from the detention centers. And I was uh, running a couple of community outreach programs for many kids, uh, especially very young, young kids. And that's when I thought I want to be more useful, um, not just practically, but just also on paper. And that's when I got a couple of certificates to make myself available for those um, in need if uh, they require my support. And that's how I started. Um, I had taken a little break because when I was working, you know, corporate Japan, you know how it is, like it gets quite chaotic and um, I was dedicating 100% of myself to business. So I never really had the bandwidth to care for, for others, which we'll touch on later. Um, but now I do. So, um, yeah, I've been doing this ever since, uh, I guess, eh, hard to define, but since February this year. But I have been doing this on and off for, for years, basically. That's beautiful. You know, um, living in Japan for four years, I've noticed that uh, when people talk about mental health, is very taboo yeah like well in my culture as well in venezuela too it's like oh you're depressed like bro drink some tequila chill <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah like it's it's that that's the way that it is so i i wanted to ask you um you have you know this passion for psychology but at the same time a lot of people think that it's quite taboo mm. how do you deal with that Right. Um, to your point, I think, you know, Japan has that mentality. It's like a samurai mentality, I call it, is, you know, and um, it was also taught during the World War II is, you know, don't want, you, you cannot have your own needs um, until we win. Right. So like major suppress your emotions, um, don't show anything. Um, and I still see it in, in Japan today. And I think that that learning is so deep rooted. But the thing is, I think what social media and, you know, so many information going back and forth is is doing to us is that it's opening doors to new ideas and perceptions and understanding of of, hey, like, you know, it's okay that we don't feel okay and it's okay to feel depressed sometimes and we don't have to be all perky and happy all the time because we're only human. So I think, you know, social media definitely has played a significant role in sort of mentioning that taboo, but also changing people's mindsets a little bit. Um. What about like changing people from, you know, from an older generation? Because I feel like that mindset, like that samurai mindset 
It's like embedded in your soul. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, I think when you've lived X amount of years, you've had a fair share of ups and downs. And many of those have experienced some really, really lows. And the thing about, you know, opening ideas to mental well-being is um, those people who have experienced the lows of the lows, I call that, you know, they have bled from their heart. And so basically when you know the pain, you can then have compassion towards other people who are experiencing something similar. Right. And um, I like to believe that many of those have the courage to bring their pain into something beautiful. And that's compassion for self and for, for others. And you, you know, when you talk about um, your past pains and past traumas, they're, they're not as, you know, defensive about it, especially when they're in, you know, their, their 50s or 60s. They're more open to talking about it because it's, it's far in their past um, that it doesn't affect them anymore. And when they are in that stage, they're able to share and they're able to, you know, extend their, their compassion and kindness. So it's really not that bad if you think about it. Right. So you do feel that things are changing little by little. Yeah, definitely. Especially, I think, during this really strange time of COVID-19, um, people are starting to learn to to support each other, which is a great, you know, mass movement. And so hopefully, you know, this, this movement won't stop, um, not just in Japan, but on a global scale. Mm, interesting, interesting. Let's, um, let's start talking about ego, because that's the main topic. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, like you just told me before, ego has many definitions, right? Oh. And for example, I feel like the, the common definition of ego is um, mistaken by someone who's arrogant, right? Mm. Oh, that person has a big ego or it's an egomaniac. It's like an arrogant person, right? Yeah. Um, can we please like establish like the, the definition of ego? Yeah, definitely. So like you said, you know, I think when we use the term ego, what we refer to is you know oftentimes someone with an inflated perception of themselves you know someone who thinks super highly of themselves and that and that transcends as arrogance um and henceforth people use ego as describing someone usually i feel like in workforces it's their managers or their bosses right um, but uh so back way back in time um we all know father freud he <laughs> the psychologist father freud um he defined the mind into three different categories one is id and what it is is a primitive part of our mind so it could be suppressed memories childhood trauma aggressive urges or a sexual drive so say for instance if you've been lining up to get your desperate cup of morning coffee and someone cuts in line when you've been lining up for half an hour you may have this i'm not saying all of us but some people might have the urge to you know like kick them in the shins you know because they're they just really want that cup of coffee. i'm not saying everybody i'm just giving you an example here okay <laughs> um, but um and that's, that's it. That's coming from id, right? And super ego on the other side. So it stands here. Super ego stands here. Super ego is the, the angel side of the mind. Or depending on the situation, it could turn into a, a nasty angel, which is not an angel anymore. <laughs> but so super ego is it, it rationalizes things. It it's more. It's not a 
everything that I'm talking about now, by the way, happens in the unconscious. So we don't know, right? Um, but superego is, it works as sort of like a conscious side of the brain. So you've been queuing for coffee for half an hour. You have this id wanting to kick someone because they cut in line. But what superego says is that you can get your coffee without kicking someone in the shin. And then the ego, which is in the middle, works as sort of like a referee, right? So it balances what it wants to do and what super ego thinks is right um, and really balances the two out and says, maybe talk to the person who just cut in front of you and rationalize with that person that you've been queuing for half an hour and you really need that cup of coffee. So that is how the mind is being set up by Freud. And ego, so essentially what it is, is a referee for your mind, right? And it operates usually as a, um, so let me take the back. So referee in a game, if you've watched tennis, anything, there's always a referee. And the referee's job is to protect the integrity of the game right? Um, paraphrase that into ego. Ego tries to protect the integrity of your identity. And ego, so aka is I, myself. So that in itself, you know, that's sort of like a quick overview of mind and the definition of ego. So ego is essentially I, myself and it operates as a referee to protect the integrity of your identity. Wow. Uh, I think I heard before that id is like a dog and then the, the owner is super ego. Like he's trying to like control those like animal to urges. Tame. Right? Right, to tame the animal. Mm -hmm. That is super interesting. How do you, then how do you form your identity? How do you form that ego? Right. So ego, you know, when you think about identity, you know, what is identity, right? It's a construct of your, your belief system. It's your patterns. Um, and most of the times those patterns in your belief systems happen on such an unconscious level, right? Um, and those patterns are learned from when you are super duper young how like, young super young like what your primary caregivers essentially taught us become our patterns and our belief system right so if you grow up in a household where um where you know unfortunately the family was completely disintegrated um your normal response to disintegration may be not as extreme as someone who came from a very extremely integrated family. Um, and so, you know, childhood traumas or things that you learned during your childhood, um, it's, it's sort of like, um, you know, when, when you're raising something, anything, right um say you're you're just for this occasion like say for instance you're you have a pet at home and you teach them different things like don't do this don't do that well you at least you try to right. um, and when your pet does something that you told him or her to do and you give them a treat that becomes their pattern yeah. so every time they do something right they get a reward so it's like a reward system that gets implemented in their patterns, right? And that's usually how you, you know, a lot of the, the pet owners treat their cats. That's how they teach them. Um, so take that in the context of human, 
I'm not sure if you've ever had experiences. I certainly, I certainly have like as a child, Mm -hmm. um, when you do something that you don't really think is wrong because you're a child, you don't know. Mm -hmm. And then, and your, your primary caregiver, in this case, it was usually my mom will come in and get angry at me for doing something that I thought, well, I didn't think I just did because I'm a child. Um, and that's when I learned certain behaviors are not welcomed. Um, and it's not just behaviors, but your emotional responses as well. And that's when it gets really tricky. Um, because when you learn that certain emotional uh, reactions are unaccepted or unwelcome, unacknowledged, and then you grow up to being an adult, you do the exact same thing for other people too. So you deny someone else's emotions or you don't acknowledge them, right? And that's how deep patterns go, right? And, you know, a lot of those things, again, happens on a such an unconscious level that understanding I, the ego, is really only by understanding your patterns. What essentially means is bringing unconscious conscious. And that's pattern work and that's belief system work. You know, that's digging into your past and really understanding where some of the behavioral or emotional responses came from and unlearning that and relearning a new pattern. I feel like I said a handful there. <laughs> wow. So what you said about um, when you do something good, they reward you. And mm-hmm. when you do something bad, they punish you. Is that conditioning? Yeah, that is definitely a part of conditioning. Got it. Got it. Um, it's, you know, those are very simplified um, examples that I gave, but mm-hmm. conditionings can, can appear in many different forms. And again, because it's unconscious, we don't often think about it. I mean, like 90% or something of the time, uh, we're operating on an unconscious level, right? which is shocking when you think about it. <laughs> but um, so bringing that, that unconscious side of yourself into the light of consciousness and mm-hmm. then learning how to break those patterns, um, especially the patterns that are not serving you, is is very key. So ego in itself isn't bad. It really isn't. Um, But and we we actually need a referee in our mind um, to operate our day to day lives. But what then becomes problematic is the unconscious side of yourself the patterns, the belief systems, the conditionings that we have um, that we don't know about, right? So then once that becomes a conscious side of ourselves, then we're able to make a more informed decision in in constructing our own identity. That is super interesting. So what you're saying is based on experiences from the past, those shape us to be the person we are today. 100%. How does culture and your gender shape your ego or your identity? Hmm. Um, Culture and, you know, the, the cultural expectations of and societal expectations of how you should be because culture and, you know, and uh, education, de- depending on different sexes, is is uh, just another construct of sort of who you're supposed to be, yeah. right? The expectation of of the external world, and so that what it becomes is a belief system, right? You you are exposed to, like we are all exposed to that idea of cultural expectations um, or gender expectations from a very young age that we don't often like question it until it becomes a problem right and so it's it becomes a part of our belief system so it does definitely play a role 
in constructing who you are and your own identity. And that also is a part of unconscious. If you don't think about it, if you don't question it, it remains in the unconscious. Mm -hmm. um, and so with, you know, childhood trauma um, and belief systems, so cultural, societal, um, all of these things combined is, is who we are, right? And so we really need to make a conscious decision in order to address those uh, belief system, especially the ones that are not working for us. When I say that are not working for us, it's not serving us anymore. Like it's making us doubt ourselves. It's, it's taming ourselves, like you said before, um, in, a, in a not so happy way. Um, you know, when you, when you realize those things, that's when we really need to deconstruct uh, where we learned this from, where it came from, and we need to learn to embrace it and let go of it and learn a new belief that works for you now. That is super interesting. How much of that is genetic? Because a lot of people think that, well, you're born as a blank slate. Mm. And then based on your experiences, you become this type of person. Mm. But some people think you are born with a certain character mm -hmm. embedded on yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I personally, there are so many opinions about it, um, but I personally believe that you can construct, you are a construct of your, of yourself, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Um, and if you can bring that unconscious to a conscious level mm -hmm. and really break down your own patterns that you have um, and learn to control your mind, because let's face it, that's the only thing you can ever control in your life. Um, you can become who you who you want to become. So, yes, some people say um, biology plays a role, and yes, in some cases, um, you know, biology definitely plays a role. Um, you know, like some say narcissism is partly due to genetics, um, or Asperger's is partly due to genetics and those are are true they are partly due to the to the dna but um i don't necessarily i'm not such a fan of um of saying all oh, because it's the dna um, because i feel like it limits the, the potential and the possibility of that person becoming who they really want to be so yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's up to it's up to your mind power, your discipline, and tenacity that would make you the the person who you want it to be. How much work does it take to become that ideal person that you want to be? Oh, <laughs> it really depends. Hey, like it depends on how much work you're willing to put in and it's hard work. It's not an easy work to do. I mean, I think, um, how I explain it is, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about your childhood and possibly, um, your childhood trauma, but not just your childhood trauma, we have, you know, uh, perhaps bruises that are relatively new and still raw. And when you're thinking about those, those past um, incidents that are really painful to you, it's really like doing an open heart surgery. Mm -hmm. And it, like, it really hurts, I think. And so it, 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 dep it depends, I think, on how deep-rooted your patterns are and how much you want to change them. Um, but what I always say is like, you know, take your time because there's really, no one is rushing you. And if someone, if something in your mind is, is hurting you, then let's just focus on that for now um, and then go from there. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So let's say you, you do the work and then you kind of like integrate your ego. 
then how can you start understanding other people? Like understanding their behaviors, their patterns, and then find a way to help them. Because I feel like that's the ultimate goal. It's like, let me help myself first. Let me become a better person first. And then I want to help other people. So how do you make that transition? Right. Oh, great question. Um, I personally believe that you don't have to wait um, till you can understand other people. And I say this because once you start learning about your own conditionings and your patterns and your unconscious, um, what it does is that doesn't necessarily transcend to understanding other people. What it does is that it gives people a benefit of the doubt, right? Because you're going through um, certain, well, you're going through an open heart surgery, essentially. Um, so then you learn to have that, that level of com compassion for yourself, right? And that compassion towards yourself extends to other people too. So it doesn't necessarily mean that understanding yourself, aka understanding other people, but it, more so what it does is you're able to extend that compassion compassion and so when someone lashes out on you for example um you can take a step back and think okay maybe that person has a childhood trauma and maybe that reenacted in that moment and that's why he's lashing out and that's why she's lashing out mm -hmm. um and that really is the ultimate defense mechanism that you can have for yourself because usually right when someone lashes out on you Right. people's response is either they just completely freeze or say something back or run away right right but you don't have to have those responses now because you know how to extend that level of compassion and the that wiggle room mm -hmm. for you to um think about really that what that person may be going through mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you don't have to necessarily wait until you feel, I mean, you do need to feel like you're ready, um, right. but you don't have to feel like, you know, you're, you're good. Um, I, I know that everyone's a, you know, a really nice person, but you don't have to feel so confident to a point that you're like, okay, I'm ready. And then, <laughs> and then start um, giving that benefit of the doubt. Like it, it naturally it's natural flow it'll happen to you it'll come to you naturally once you start doing this work perfect so let's do a little role play or mm -hmm. a little scenario let's say we're in starbucks mm -hmm. and it's like i don't know it's early in the morning i need to have my coffee and let's say you didn't see me for any reason like you cut in line and then i just lash out on you like girl what the hell blah 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 how would you respond to me having mm -hmm. all this information about ego and like childhood traumas how would you respond to me right i'll give you two so if i'm not, not doing the work i will probably take it very personally and either right. lash out back at you or i would just freeze and completely ignore your existence <laughs> but if I am doing the work, right, uh, which I am too, by the way, every day, um, but I would ask as to why you have lashed out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And hopefully you will have a response for me. Right. And if that's an angry one, that's right. okay. Because mm -hmm. I'm only trying to hear you out. Mm. And then if you told me that I've cut in line, because we all know the importance of morning coffee, <laughs> I would apologize. And, you know, if I'm feeling generous that day, I will buy you coffee for making you feel that angry. Um, and then just, you know, go about my day. Right. But I, I feel like I, I love your answer, but I feel like it's really easy to say it now that we're on Zoom and we're like chill and we know each other. But like if we're in the coffee shop and I lash out to you, like, you know, like in, in the heat of the moment, 
mm. right? Like, how how would you control that that id, that animal reaction to either like lash out or like freeze? How how, how would you control that? Right. You know, like, um, like breathe and then like, well, what, what would you do? Yeah, I mean, breathing is actually a very effective tool, um, more than more than people believe. And uh, another thing that you can do is to really feel your feet on the ground. Oh. Mm, breathing and doing that uh, usually sort of like calms you down. So when you're in that moment, if you're in the office or something or Starbucks anywhere, and when you feel like someone is going to lash out on you or have lashed out on you and you just feel that urge, just remember to breathe and feel your, your feet on the ground. Mm. yeah um but yes breathing um but also you know there's i think there's always a reason why when people get angry mm -hmm. like people don't get angry just because right um and so you know you have to sort of like really take take a step back learning to take a step back that's very important but you can do that as you breathe and feel your feet on the ground mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so you know so so let's do that and then think okay this person is very angry but if you get angry the situation is going to get so much worse and the only response that you can control is your mind mm. right you can never control other people ever so um the only thing in that situation they have control over is what's going on in your head and you have to it's it, this is another pattern that you can learn as you do your ego work mm -hmm. um and and once you start learning that it'll come out as a natural response but right. you have to keep at it mm -hmm. every single day and i do this work too um all the things i'm saying now i do this for myself as well right. and usually you know you gave me an, a great example of like starbucks morning situations but believe it or not um those uh patterns your childhood trauma um your unconscious uh explodes when you're with with your intimate partner your family or someone really close to you Right. And I think during COVID-19, staying home, spending so much time with the, the, your, your partner or your family or your, your close friends or whoever that may be. Um, and I believe this was one of the biggest, and it still remains to be one of the biggest challenges for many people because um, if you don't know your unconscious and how to bring your unconscious to a conscious level then you'll keep you know repeating those patterns of lashing out being angry being this being that um because of your your past and and so ego work isn't just beneficial for you but it's also very beneficial for people around you and the people that you love the most right so do you do you think that when you when there's a situation that uh, triggers you mm -hmm. and then you lash out or you get angry do you think that you connect that situation with something that happened in the past and i'm asking you because uh what my mentor told me before is that when we have a lot of ego mm -hmm we live in the past right so basically his definition of ego was the pain of the past right so every time i saw something or i experienced something that made me feel angry or triggered mm. he recommended me to ask two questions mm -hmm. and number one is what year is it and who are you mm -hmm. So what year is it? Like, why do you feel that way? Mm -hmm. Does that action brings you to a time in your life where you felt that same way? And mm -hmm. who are you? Because he was talking about like uh, shadow work yeah. and how you like 
grab different parts of your identity and you make them into like personas. Have you heard that before? Mm -hmm. I watched that um that episode um that you have with your with your mentor. Yeah, so please, if, if you could like expand a little bit on that, especially with the with the year part, like the past. Mm -hmm. Like so, you know, like you to your point, triggers are a really good indication, right? And what it does is it's a reenactment of your trauma. Mm. And that's why you respond in certain ways. And perhaps um, when it happened, you may have been a child who didn't know anything. And uh, an adult or your primary caregiver just got really angry at you and you had no idea as to why and this happens all the time in during your childhood years right and i'm not saying that the, it's the primary caregiver's fault right because one thing to remember is that your your parents your family your primary caregivers they have their own set of trauma too so they're doing their best to protect you um but that doesn't necessarily mean that those protections and those patterns work for you now right and you know one of the things that i often talk about is forgive your primary caregivers because they were doing their best mm -hmm. they really were and we should you know all be appreciative of the things that they've taught us um but also it's okay to let go letting go doesn't mean that you appreciate them less that means you really actually do appreciate them and their effort in bringing you um, to a person that you are today. So yes, so going back to the, the ear part, we all have to remember that it is 2020. It's not, you know, 19 something when you were a child. So um, it, it's one of the things that, um, so I've actually been to places like Rwanda because I was studying about genocide. And so, you know, when you go to those places, one of the things that you have to make sure to remind yourself is that it's not, it's not back then, it's right now. So what that essentially means is that you don't, you don't have to relive the past. We, you don't have to bring those those pains um of the atrocities that you know it, you can leave it there um and we can then look at it from a perspective of now right so we don't have to carry everything from the past um to the present moment right i would like to know if possible like what was the Rieko before the ego work and the you now? Like what changed? Ah, <laughs> a lot of things, I think. Um, so it, I've had a fair share of, um, we all have, mm -hmm. uh, really, 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 really low moments mm -hmm. and um, I think, so, you know, I, I don't recall a lot of childhood trauma per se, but I definitely remember, you know, and I, and I'm not sure if you can, so actually, I feel like a lot of people can relate to this, is that, you know, when you're a child, right, and you're, you're playing around, when some, something makes you really happy, a child knows how to express their happiness, but um they may not be as articulate <laughs> right but, so the the way they express their happiness may be like jumping around running around climbing trees um and but if you think about it like primary caregivers if, especially if you're like climbing a tree or something they will tell you to be careful they will tame your happiness by telling you to be careful however when you're sad um, as, you know, some adults may have said, don't be sad, which is not a good thing, by the way. <laughs> um, it's okay to be sad. But, you know, they, they may have been there for you. They may have showed 
a lot of empathy and kindness and compassion when you were happy and like jumping around like monkeys i'm not sure if they extend it the same level of of happiness right they told you to be careful but did they tell it to be more happy not quite interesting so when you when you think about that in in a context of adulthood it's really difficult to find someone who will double your happiness and lessen your sadness right um and that's that i believe is because it it happened from our childhood of that you know oh you're you're too happy you have to be careful i mean what what does too happy mean even but you know um and when you're too sad there's no such thing as too sad it's okay to be sad um and so when you when you grow up as being an adult we get so good at being of being in the mindset of sadness as opposed to being in the mindset of happiness right and and that's where i was like hang on <laughs> you know um and so that's one of the the patterns and conditionings that we learn from our childhood and something that you know i try to be mindful of is that when my friends are happy i try to be there to maximize it have a party because they're happy you know as opposed to oh you should but have you thought about this have you thought about that right right, right. <laughs> yeah and that, that's like one of the examples but um yeah i think especially uh, working in corporate japan um there there's so many things that or it's just a lot of conditioning on a cultural level mm -hmm. and um you know especially when when you're a woman um or or men in some cases obviously but you know right. working in corporate japan you're exposed to to so many different things like sexual harassment is definitely real here and yeah um i've actually had a fair share of, of that and it was horrific yeah. and so having gone through that and really realizing you know some of the patterns and conditions that i had and then really doing the dissecting my past and right. you know all the things um was was definitely helpful for me and i think it was helpful for for my husband as well i don't think we'll be married if i didn't do the work <laughs> so, yeah gotcha so it definitely it was very beneficial to do the work Right. Um, Diego, I wanted to talk about something that's quite interesting because um, the reason why we connected was because of Brittany's um, podcast. Yeah. Shout out to Brittany. Nice. I'm good. <laughs> so, um, and you sent me a message mm. on LinkedIn, and then you said that you liked the fact that I said we have to crave adversity. Mm. And the reason why I'm bringing this phrase is because uh, with Corona, things have changed, definitely. Mm. But just before Corona, I feel like we live, or like our generation is made of by people who want everything to be easy mm -hmm. or who want to live in like, like surrounded by bubble wrap, you feel mm -hmm. me? Where everything has to be easy everything is too offensive you gotta be nice if there's something bad don't mention it and in japan i have noticed this too mm. where if there's an inconvenience people will not voice it they will just like oh just shut up and in the west if there's a very minor inconvenience like very very minor people will get triggered and i feel like just people nowadays are very soft like super soft especially men well well we'll get to that in in another episode but um why were you so touched by the fact that i said you gotta crave adversity right um like you said i think it's within our nature to want to be in a comfortable situation or the environment and 
you know, when you think about it, a, a lot of the, the choices that we make are unconscious, right? Um, and so when you're operating on an unconscious level, obviously you're operating from a, a place of protection. So naturally the environment that we would construct um, is, is going to be safe for, for us by default because safety serves us. And I'm not saying that you know safety is a bad thing. It's actually very necessary for personal growth. Um, but I think there's a, there's a fine line in between being too comfortable and feeling safe. Right. And, you know, I, um, I actually wrote an article a few, I think months ago, but if you have plants growing at home, um, it, it's something that I think about often when I look at my balcony and to my plants. Um, and so here's a here's a question for you actually um cherry blossoms we all know that it's it's bright it's beautiful it soothes our soul um why do you think cherry blossoms blossom in spring well is it like a metaphor Oh, it's not, it's not science. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not looking for like, oh, because uh, the oxygen level was Right, 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 right. Um, is it because they have been through a lot of like, I would say, um, like very like, um, difficult weather and then because of this adversity, they bloom that beautiful? Yeah, perfect answer. Actually, cherry blossoms have to go through a harsh winter. It's a must. Mm -hmm. um, if they don't, they may not blossom as, as much as it would. Um, and so harsh winters are the natural wall that's required for cherry blossoms to bloom. We as humans cannot live apart from that natural wall. Mm -hmm. So we need to go through adversities um, and discomfort in order to become the person who we want to be or beyond who we want to be, right? And that's why I thought, you know, when you said um, we have to crave for, for adversity um, was, was very significant because, like you said, um many of us don't want it <laughs> because obviously it's uncomfortable and you know and what adversity and discomfort in our lives does is that it exposes us in a way that you know kind of presents us to the to the idea of 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 ego of, of ourselves and which then means that we are now forced to face our patterns or conditionings and really that having to sort of face yourself is one of the hardest things we can all do in our lives. So I can understand why people don't want it because it's hard work. I mean, who does want, who wants to do an open heart surgery, right? Um, but we, we kind of have to do it and i say have to mm -hmm. because i don't want people to live in a mindset of suffering mm -hmm. but if the longer you wait to do this work the more potential you're building in living in a mindset of suffering you don't have to suffer in your mind suffering is not necessary in your mind pain is suffering is not so so yes, I completely get your point. People are, are very protective by nature. Um, but what I love to challenge everyone is to, is to sort of like get out there, get out of your, get out of your mind, your patterns, your, your unconscious and, and give it a little stir, mm -hmm. you know, and see what comes up mm -hmm. and, and then go from there. Right.
I was actually watching um, an interview with Kevin Hart, the comedian. Mm -hmm. Then he was saying that uh, one of the things that really helped him overcome like poverty and become very successful was the fact that his father, he put him in situations where Kevin didn't know what to do. Mm. So he just had to like act and try to do something. So he would say that uh, he would take him to a pool. Kevin didn't know how to swim. He would grab him and just like push him into the water and be like, swim. And he said, because of that, I am very successful. Because my dad threw me in situations where I didn't know how to manage. I suffered, I struggled, and then I learned. And I feel like nowadays, that's something that's really missing. Uh, not me, because, you know, in, in Venezuela, my parents are very old school, and my dad was like that. He's like, learn, fail, suffer, go. But I see that in countries like in America, um, Japan, parents, they protect their children too much. Mm. And I, I understand it's with good intention. Mm. They love them and they want them to be safe. But sometimes I feel like it's too much and they put them into this bubble. Mm. But then when they go to the real world, they get screwed. Is there a way that we can do this, like for people who don't have this experience, like do this to ourselves? Like, let's say I want to learn Chinese and I don't know a word. I'm like, dude, drop me in the middle of Shanghai and let me survive or something like that. Like, what, what, what do you think about that technique? Um, to be honest, <laughs> uh, I, can, I can think of, a, uh, you know, it, it's good. It works for some people, but I certainly understand how it won't for some. Mm -hmm. um, and I see a couple of red flags, but also I can understand how it could work. <laughs> so, I mean, there's no, there's no, um, one solution or one way that fits all right mm -hmm. and you know the way kevin hart was trained by his father worked for him mm -hmm. um and that's great because kevin hart made it work for him mm -hmm. right he had the he had the mind power to make it work mm -hmm. but for some may not have that muscle trained enough to make it work for them so if you put somebody in Kevin Hart's situation who may not have that that like adversity muscle development, um, someone might get really depressed. So you know there there's no one size fits all situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, you you reminded me of of a of a very old saying in Japan, and it it goes in Japanese. It goes. And what that means is, you know, if you love your daughter, let our journey on. And what, what that quote encompasses is, you know, let her be, let, let her suffer, let her <laughs> do her work um, and just let her go, right? And, um, and personally, my father definitely did that for me. Right, like I decided to go to Australia, and believe it or not, back when I went, I couldn't really speak English, so I struggled in my everyday life. University was hell for me because I didn't understand um, most of the things that like the, the, the lecturers were were saying, and um, it was very unfortunate because one of the first uh, subjects I took was on international law because I was studying about international terrorism. So it, it was nothing but a struggle. But without it, you know, obviously, I don't think I would have been able to speak English uh, like I do now. So, you know, and, and that's just a yeah, tip of an iceberg, right? Um, when you go to a different country, of course, you would know this. And I feel like a lot of listeners would know this as well is that, you know, you you get exposed to so many different things and you you are forced then to learn about yourself because you have to 
to survive. You have to, to keep on going. And so I think I, I am a huge fan of going into the unknown land <laughs> and put, putting yourself in that situation. But I also understand that it's not for everybody. Um, and what I believe in is that, yes, I would love for everybody to do this like dissection and understand yourself and et cetera. But if it's the right time for you, the opportunity will come to you. And you don't have to seek for struggles. You don't have to seek for pain because in life, it'll come to you, whether you like it or not. And when you hit a wall, that's your opportunity, right? Like walls are there because you were meant to meet that wall. Take that as an opportunity and then go from there, learn from there. And that's never too late. I love that. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful response. All right, Diego. Um, our last topic is business. Because yeah. I know you, you do like a hybrid of uh, mental health. Uh, you're a therapist, but you also are an e-commerce consultant, mm -hmm. which I think is really cool. Like that's such a cool combination. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And your branding is really cool as well. My... So, let me see here. So how can you translate this into business? Like, okay, you know yourself, you did the work, you can um, understand other people, empathize with them. How can you translate this to business? Right. First of all, I think it makes you better at communicating. Right. And business is a construct of many communications. Right. And a lot of the work that I do as an e-commerce consultant is to listen to clients, understand their needs and wants, and um, sometimes go beyond what they're looking for and provide um, tools and services that are necessary for them to succeed. Um, therapy isn't far off from that. You know, some people may say certain things, but, you know, like oftentimes, you when you dig deeper there's more to say um so when you take that into into business you're able to present with a solution that they're looking for and more so being better at communicating is is definitely a huge plus right and being a better communicator essentially comes from being a good listener right and there, there's a lot of, there are a lot of articles about active listening. And I don't think active listening is actually enough. I think attentive listening is necessary. And the difference is, you know, active listening is like opening your mind and then mm -hmm. being present. Mm -hmm. um, but what I mean by attentive listening is, you know, opening your mind and being present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that's enough. And what we need to do is to is to be there with them emotionally as well um, so that you can really grasp the what they're they're trying to say and and where they're coming from um, and then sort of articulate that and put that in a strategy right for them to succeed mm -hmm. so I think, yeah, I think communication is, is listening and listening is understanding other people on an emotional level, um, not just on like the surface level, but in order to do that, you really have to know you, you have to know how to listen to yourself. Um, because if you can do that to yourself, you can do that for other people. But you know, we all know that if we can't do something for ourselves, there's no way we can do that for other people, right? Right. Um, so I, that that's where I, I see um, how, you know, coaching therapy comes in quite handy uh, when you're running a business. So how do people react when you do attentive listening? Because I feel like um, in Japan, when I do business, people do active listening yeah uh, it's very common here 
But uh, I sometimes feel like it's very on the surface. Mm. Like, same as in the West. It's like, oh, yeah, really? Oh, so you said blah, blah, blah. But are you really understanding, you know, my heart? Mm. So when you, when you do attentive listening, how do people react? Uh, one of the, the most recent feedbacks I got was like, uh, my client said, if I, every time I speak to you, I feel like I'm speaking to a sommelier, you know, about wine mm. and you bring out this wine that I, I thought I kind of wanted, but I wasn't sure what it was until we brought it, um, to me and thought this is exactly, actually, this is exactly what I wanted. Yeah, so I think, you know, with whatever business you're, you're in, um, when someone is really attentively heard, they know. And one of the biggest problems that we have um, in, in many situations is that people don't feel like they're being heard mm. or acknowledged, right? And this, is, this happens not only in business context, but also with, um, actually, a lot of the times is with families or intimate partners. You're not hearing me, right? I'm sure we've all said this phrase before, um, especially when you're in an argument, you're not hearing me. No, you're not hearing me, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and what comes into play again is like the, the ability to attentively listen and the, the component of attentiveness is compassion. So we need to learn to, again, learn to be compassionate towards oneself, to ourselves. But to do that, you know, we have to go deep into um, the open heart surgery process uh, because compassion takes time to build it's a muscle and you've got to train it right um and so i think everything sort of comes in for full circle interesting so once you have compassion for yourself you can listen to others with compassion mm. and that will make them feel truly heard mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, the, especially in relationship context, right? The whole, no, you're not hearing me, but no, you're not hearing me. And, you know, it's like a, and I call it a compassion tug of war. <laughs> they both want compassion. They, they both want attentive um, listening, but because they're in that fight mode, uh, it's like a never ending tug of war, right? But if one person in that situation and say, I'm gonna take a step back, I'm gonna breathe um, and take a moment. And then I'm going to just put my agendas aside and I'm going to just 100% going to listen to you without judgment. There's no fate anymore. It's over, you know? Um, I'm not saying which one won, like there's no winning or losing in that situation, but it completely diffuses the tension, right? But in order to, to do that, to be able to take a step back in that moment and put aside your agenda, that can only come from having this incredible compassion muscle for yourself. Wow, that was amazing. That was perfect. And um, Diego, is, do you have like, um like a trial session or something like that? Because like me personally, I would love to like use your services. Do you have like a, like a trial session or something like that? Um, I don't quite have a trial session, but um, I'm happy to work out whatever works for, for people. Mm. Um, I also have a, a workbook on alignment and I usually charge for those, but um, I'll give you and all the listeners a 
coupon code, so you don't have to pay anything for that. And what I try to do with this alignment workbook and um, how it's designed is, um, so, so patterns and things are unrecognizable usually, right? Because it happens on an unconscious level. Um, and so in order to kind of understand little triggers in our lives, it gets really easy to do when you're completely aligned. And when I say aligned, um, I mean by what you're thinking, your thoughts, mm -hmm. your words, and your actions are all 100% aligned. And you may think, oh, impossible. <laughs> um, it may be difficult, um, you know, to, to be aligned 100% of the time, every second of the day. Um, but I'd say if you're like, 70% and above aligned most of the time, uh, you'll be able to, to recognize those little cues uh, because you'll feel out of whack. You know, when, when there's a trigger or when you're doing something that's not serving you um, or when someone says something and you have this response, uh, you'll be able to tell that you're not aligned. And so in that, in that moment, you'll be able to then go deep dive into, okay, why am I having this response? Is there another response? You know, where did this come from? Where does it stem from? And usually, you know, you, you trickle it down and um, usually it comes from, from your childhood oftentimes. But that gives you um, sort of like a opening door to understanding yourself better and henceforth practicing self-compassion. That's amazing. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll share the, the code uh, with you later so maybe you can like, post it. Definitely, definitely. Well, I'm gonna yeah. share it with uh, our attendees today. Yeah, and perfect. Yeah, I think that's the perfect way to end our session. Before we end, I want to ask you though, I always ask our attendees, and uh, my question is, what is the change that you would like to see in the world? I have one goal, <laughs> really, is to, is to alleviate suffering. And I say this, you know, in, in, throughout this session as well as that, state of suffering is not necessary. You know, pain, discomfort, um, hurt, that may be a necessary fuel for us to grow. It's like, you know, cherry blossoms going through a really, really harsh winter. And we, we all need winter uh, if it's necessary. But suffering is a state of your soul. And it's not necessary. So what I try to do by addressing, you know, conditionings and patterns and belief systems and, and challenging my clients to really take a step back and reflect on those points is because I don't want them to suffer. I don't want them to. So suffering is, can become, you know, come in a physical level, but also on an emotional level. Um, and suffering, I mean by this, is suffering in your mind. Right. And that is not necessary. And what I try and do is to, is to alleviate that so, and equip people so that they don't have to live in a state um, of, of suffering. Perfect. I love it. I think that's the perfect way to end the show.